All right. Well, uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Demetrius Asanis, who's going to speak to us today about the end of an ice age where ice is internal combustion engine. Demetrius received his PhD and MS and BS degrees in mechanical engineering from the University of Michigan. And he came to Stony Brook in the spring of 2020 from the University of Delaware, where he was a postdoctoral research fellow and principal engineer at Asanis and Associates uh, Consulting Company. His research focuses on improving the efficiency of energy conversion, power generation, and propulsion systems. And today we'll put that into an ice age. So thank you very much. Thank you for that wonderful introduction, Alan. Um, so hi, everyone. My name is Demetrius Sanis. Uh, I'll be sharing with you a little bit about uh, my own research as well as my uh, research group's uh, work. Uh, and this is kind of a fun time to, to highlight everything. Of course, given the energy nexus uh, that we're going through today, especially given the unfortunate events happening uh, in Eastern Europe at the moment, uh, it's, it's always kind of interesting to reevaluate you know, what we're doing and, and how we're doing it uh, as we can get easily bogged down in the details in our daily lives of, uh, of uh, trying to get our research wins. So today I'll be chatting about uh, the end of an ice age, the internal combustion engine age. I like to often bring this Disney graphic here of uh, the ice age because uh, you never know quite what you're talking about. Um, but hopefully I'll give you some good food for thought here of why we're not quite there yet. So for those of you that are not familiar with an internal combustion engine, uh, you can see here a graphic of a reciprocating piston engine. And this one happens to be of the four stroke variety. That means that that piston goes up and down twice for every one cycle. Uh, as far as we're concerned, this is a thermodynamic conversion device. It essentially inhales air, you add fuel to it, you can have combustion that occurs, and then you force that piston by building pressure in this enclosed chamber. And that linear motion of the piston going downwards is converted to rotational motion that we harness uh, to produce torque. And that's what drives your transmission and ultimately the wheels in that vehicle that got to you today. If you have any students or any interest yourselves and want to learn more about the fundamentals of internal combustion engines and how they're designed, uh, I offer a class, a uh, uh, senior level technical elective and uh, entry graduate level, um, and it's offered every fall, so MEC 423-523. And I always like to look at a little bit the history of engines. Uh, and the reason why it's because nothing is ever new in our field and we always struggle, you know, what are we going to burn today or how are we going to reevaluate the cylinder pressure data when essentially the first engine was out there in 1860. So it's, it's kind of hard to do novel things or so it may seem. But the reality is that engines have come a very, very long way. And so has the instrumentation and so have our, our analytic, analytical techniques and our uh, computational abilities. And they're essentially unlocking and the manufacturing techniques are just unlocking new waves of technology developments that we can contribute to. So engines started in 1860 uh, when Lenoir built the first coal gas air mixture uh, fired engine. And these things were really, really dirty. And in fact, it wasn't until about 1876 uh, that Otto built the first four stroke engine that essentially operated on gasoline. And the volume was uh, around 50,000 engines at that time in the US and Europe. In 1893, uh, Rudolf Diesel received the first patent for the compression ignition engine. These are basically your, your diesel fueled engines that you see today, uh, kind of the opposite of the gasoline uh, auto or automobile engines. Um, and it wasn't until 1908, which is when most folks believe that the engine was invented, uh, what actually happened there is the production of the Model T from Ford, the vehicle started happening and it became affordable for the masses to have now transportation with an internal combustion engine. Now, these engines were horrendous back then in 1908, over 100 years ago, about 20 horsepower, which is, you know, you kind of laugh at today, right? Uh, and the compression ratio was so low, it was four and a half to one, you know, if even students, you know, in my thermodynamic class would kind of look at it and say, there's no way we can harness any real uh, work out of such low compression ratio. Uh, 
Uh, and their fuel economy actually wasn't so bad compared with the whole things uh, equal. It was somewhere in the range of 13 to 20, nothing to, to, to write home about, uh, but vehicles back then were much, much lighter. And I think that contributed to the relatively equivalent fuel economy. There was a lot less amenities uh, and they were extremely small, 20 horsepower. Granted, you needed almost three liters, so 3,000 cc's of air plus fuel to mix in to get those 20 horsepowers, which in today's world, a 2.9 liter engine can produce passenger vehicle, nothing in the performance racing world can produce maybe about 600 horsepower, just to give you an idea how far we've come with our technological advancements. 1939, we had the first uh, production car with a diesel engine. 1970s, we had the uh, Clean Air Act that came in and we essentially had to put three-way catalysts on there in order to reduce any of the emissions that were coming out of these internal combustion engines. So it wasn't just about power and fuel economy and affordability. For the first time in, in the 60s and 70s, we were learning about pollution and really having to mitigate it uh, and the very first attempt at taking care of it was adding a device and essentially an after treatment device to clean it up. In the 2000s, we start having our very first hybrid, the Toyota Prius, uh, which has had a remarkable success in the market. Uh, 20 years later, they almost make it, uh, they almost make it sound, uh, it has had the equivalent in the automotive world, uh, the same adoption curve as that of the iPhone. So relatively different scales, but about that much impact has occurred because of the hybridization of vehicles from Toyota introducing the Prius. And then we keep making progress to, towards lower emissions, cleaner engines, better fuel economy. And in 2017, we get this fantastic article on the right-hand side of The Economist, the death of the internal combustion engine. In 2017, I was just wrapping up my doctoral degree and I'm like, oh no, I've definitely picked the wrong field to go into. There's, there's no way, you know, if, if this is this engine that looks like it's dilapidated in a junkyard, then I must, I must maybe start studying something different. But I just spent almost 10 years getting, getting my degree. I was kind of worried. So what led us to this article in 2017? And a lot of it started from our awareness of the environment. And specifically, the, the Paris Climate Agreement essentially pinpointed, I think, you know, for the first time in, in a very systematic way, a lot of the countries got together and they basically said, look, you know, we have to start curbing our CO2 uh, emission. Uh, this came on the heels or shortly thereafter uh, was the Dieselgate scandal, which was just a horrendous disaster of some very unethical engineers operating within the company. And essentially the engine got extremely bad press and for a good reason. But, you know, I ask myself, if the engines have been around from 1860s until 2017 to get such an article, how bad of a job did we do as combustion researchers if this is the outcome, right? And I view this as a challenge and I think so do a lot of the individuals um, of my peers that are kind of in my wave and we're kind of thinking there's no way this is really the problem, right? I mean, the engine just compresses air and it can create a way to ignite a mixture, but I mean, it isn't fundamentally evil, the device itself. So what is the problem? And the problem has to do with, if we backtrack to when we were all in high school chemistry, we learned about combustion reactions and chemical equilibrium reactions. And we specifically learned that a fuel plus an oxidizer, in this case, air, creates some products. And if your fuel has carbon in it, then you're forced to make CO2. So really the problem is not the engine. The problem is the fuel that we put in it. And we've become so dependent on these fossil fuels because within the carbon and hydrogen bonds, there's so much energy stored and we've gotten very good at the ability to crack that energy and release it, that we become addicted to it. So really, if we want to reduce CO2, but save the engine, we really have to eliminate the fuel. And this fuel that has fossil carbon is really the problem. 
what do, when you use fossil fuels, I mean, this is the simplest way that I know how to describe this, but ultimately we're drilling the earth and fossil fuels are essentially sequestered carbon in the middle of the earth. And when we pump up that carbon or the, the fossil fuel, the petroleum through you know, the, the, the long drills and, and the oil wells, and then we burn it in the engine. Now we release it in the atmosphere. We're basically taking sequestered CO2 and allowing it now to gather into the atmosphere. Being that it is a triatomic molecule, it's able to store a lot more energy and essentially we're able to heat up the atmosphere. So the ultimate solution is to remove CO2. Now that's not quite the story that we hear today, right? So of course, light duty vehicles are electrifying. I think that's kind of guaranteed. We even see this future of 100% electrification in the near future, far future, at some future, that's, that's for certain. Uh, but let's look at kind of what I like to call the inefficient intermediate period, which is today, the present day. Now what we can accomplish in 50 years, right? I hope to be retired hopefully on some beach in 50 years, but until that day comes, you know, I think there's a whole lot of work we can do and we shouldn't throw the baby out with the bathtub here or bathwater, however the saying goes. So there's about 1.3 billion vehicles worldwide of which 280 uh, some million vehicles are in the U.S. and approximately the same amount are in Europe. In the U.S. specifically, we effectively retire uh, close to 15 to 20 million vehicles a year, but we also reintroduce about 15 to 20 million vehicles a year. Uh, let's say about 15 million. Uh, and then essentially that means that there's a 20-year changeover. So whatever the latest and greatest technology that you buy today, that vehicle is probably going to be around for approximately 20 years before that fleet has rolled over. Of course, shy of any of the classical historic cars, et cetera. And in that, what are we selling? You know, and these are intentionally pre-pandemic numbers. Um, what are we selling? We're basically selling over 90% gasoline vehicles. And these gasoline vehicles are going to be around for another 20 years. And the vehicle today that we're buying will also be around for another 20 years. And yes, of course, there's a future where we have hybrids and elect electrified vehicles, right? But right now we're talking about a market share that's less than 4% combined. So that means that we have a lot of work to do to clean up these internal combustion engines because we're not ready to have a rapid transition. And rapid, I don't mean in 10 years or 20 years, I mean in a year or two because we still are selling these vehicles and there still is a need for research and technological advancements. Europe, maybe a little bit better, right? Because of their policies, we see about 10% hybridization, 7% electrification. But you know, this, this is only maybe a quarter or a fifth of the total world fleet. And even if you look at very aggressive states like California, that New York State loves to lead and follow their recipe. And the reality is California is one of the most progressive electrified states. And we still see less than five or 10% combined electric plus hybrid powertrains in light duty vehicles. That means that there's still 80% of gas and vehicles being sold out there. So there's a lot of work for us. And if you actually look at the historic or historic, the future uh, forecast trends, and I like to you know, cross over and go to the business world here for a second and, and look at some of these electric vehicle outlook reports, not from the technological standpoint, this is from the financial side and what kind of the expect the industries will bear and the consumers will, uh, will take, right? And ultimately you kind of start to see that electrified vehicles are 100% gonna be there. In fact, we're expecting at least 50% by 2035 of new vehicle sales to be electric, but they're not necessarily gonna be traveling the same miles, vehicle miles traveled as the non-electric vehicles. Certainly there will be a lot of electrified vehicles, which essentially means it's gonna be a hybridized powertrain between internal combustion and electric motor. But the pure electric vehicles, even if they're 50% by 2040 or 2035, we start to look at kind of the global passenger vehicle miles traveled by, by drivetrain. And you start to see that there is an overwhelming majority of there's almost 1 billion miles traveled expected from internal combustion engines. Probably none of those will be sole internal combustion engines, fine. 
but we still have that internal combustion engine buried inside the hybridized powertrain. So we have to figure out a way to make it more efficient, make it cleaner, and remove the fuel, the fossil fuel that is presently burning today and replace it. If you need maybe a little bit other convincing why it's not so clear cut that we can just change over to 100% electric vehicles tomorrow, it has 100% to do with our grid. And that's because the grid is not clean today. The grid relies on coal, it re relies on fossil fuel, and it relies on a very small amount of renewable energy. You have to understand, I'm 100% for renewable energy, for electrification, with electrification of vehicles. Like all of this can't come soon enough is a problem. And, you know, it's good to make our decisions based on what we have today, because most of us aren't going to keep a car for 40 years or 30 years, right? Maybe the best of us will keep a car for 10 years or 15. So you kind of have to make the decisions based on what is present and not what we would like the present to be. So, you know, I came from Southeast Michigan. You look at Southeast Michigan, it's not the cleanest grid, right? 38 miles per gallon equivalent if you had a vehicle that burned gasoline for the amount of CO2 emitted versus buying an electric vehicle and then actually plugging it in to the grid. That's not great at all. Of course, more remote areas like Hawaii um, and Alaska, um, Pacific Northwest, a lot of hydro, the grid becomes cleaner, right? And you're in these numbers of 94 miles per gallon. Fantastic. We got to be at 100 plus, almost 200 miles per gallon. I mean, that's really where we need to be. Okay. But in today's day and age, why go buy out, why go out in New York, Long Island and buy a Tesla? Nothing wrong if you like the car, if you enjoy driving it. Absolutely, right? They're very futuristic. I think Elon Musk has done a fantastic job at pushing the entire automotive industry forward. But from a greenhouse gas perspective and from a pollution perspective, if you have to plug in that Tesla today on New York, Long Island, right here, 47 miles per gallon equivalent. You can actually go buy a much cheaper Toyota Prius Prime today and run it exclusively on gasoline and achieve a 10% better fuel economy. So if you really care about the environment, you'd actually pass up on that electric vehicle, as bizarre as it may sound. And then, in fact, if you did right and you actually used the hybridized powertrain and you had a little bit of electric charge as well, because that can change the mode of, of the powertrain itself and how it operates, you can unlock more efficiency, then ultimately you could be hitting these numbers of around 133 miles per gallon equivalent if you use the plug-in hybrid electric vehicle aspect of, of, of the vehicle itself. So it's not clear cut yet. And I hope in 10 years these numbers change and Orsted drills faster into the ground to put the pylons in and we get more renewable energy online. But the reality of the matter is right now we're not there. We run clean power plants on Long Island, but they still rely on natural gas. And they're much better than what we see in Pennsylvania area and what we see in Southeast Michigan, but still we're kind of a far cry away from having clean electricity. So we can't put the cart before the horse and say that, you know, our job is done. Okay, so that takes me from 2017, from the death of the internal combustion engine to, well, it's not quite done yet. And we got to start reinventing ourselves because what we've been doing clearly does not work right and it's not a solution and that's the goal of my research group so we're the advanced combustion energy systems laboratory we're located at our tech and at air tech and i also have an affiliate appointment here at ikes that affords us our abilities to study aspects of combustion fuels uh, as well as energy conversion in a multitude of systems we mostly focus on liquid and gaseous fuels uh, but also have been uh, expanding into solid fuels. And ultimately, our goal is to provide a cleaner and efficient intermediate period, and perhaps even unlock some potential pathways for those hard to decarbonize areas. So trains, planes, ships will not be electric. I mean, that's just, it's, it's not a reasonable solution based on the amount of energy density that's needed, okay? But 
the reality is even if you electrify all passenger vehicles, you know, you, you can't run a mine with big, big vehicles on pure electricity. It's just not feasible. And if the government was so keen on pushing us in this direction, I mean, the easiest fleets to electrify are captive fleets. I am still boggled by the fact that the U.S. Postal Service refuses to go to all electric vehicles. So, I mean, there's just so many examples and we have so much progress to make. And I'm not here to throw kind of, you know, sand or mud in, in anyone's face because the reality is we need each other, right? Because these are going to be complementary technologies, but there is a very clear cut role for advanced research in internal combustion engines in order to buy us as much time as possible to complete this 100% renewable electricity. And then perhaps we talk about electrolysis and green hydrogen as an energy carrier for those hard to decarbonize sectors, and maybe even ammonia uh, in that case. So I don't do this work alone. I have a fantastic team uh, in my laboratory. Uh, you can see here a few of the faces uh, that make all this work possible starting from on the left, uh, postdoc Chognan Ram, who just received his PhD this past summer. Dr. Ruinan Yang also finished this past summer, and she is now at Cummins. Uh, Rodrigo Risto Hadlich is a doctoral candidate uh, and is uh, a fantastic experimentalist uh, in the laboratory and has really worked a lot on biofuel research. Uh, Yanis, Mahmoud, and Garov are uh, Ike's students uh, themselves. They use Seawolf the cluster quite a bit. Uh, in their computational combustion research. Jason is a new addition to our group and is working on solid fuel combustion, another experimentalist. And Amr is a brilliant Fulbright master's student uh, who's uh, just finishing up his thesis and uh, has uh, just been accepted into the doctoral program and hopefully a future Ike student uh, as well. So what are some of the things that we can do? and in order to improve the engine. And really, we focus on a few different areas. One of them is we look for new fuels. So these fuels have to be low carbon, they have to be carbon neutral, and they even have to be carbon free, right? If we really want to talk about improving the world and still having a role for the internal combustion engine. The way once we have one of these fuels, does not necessarily mean that it will want to ignite or combust in any of the traditional ways that we are aware with it. So while we explore these new fuels, we essentially have to pair them with an advanced combustion mode in order to actually get the thermal chemical conversion to occur for the fuel itself. And some of this may be experimentally done, but the prototyping is very expensive and takes a long time. And without the use of computational tools, such as the resources that are afforded at Ike's for us, we would either price ourselves out of the market for making any improvements, or we would be just too slow, literally having to cut the metal in order to accomplish this. I think one of the most fantastic projects in the group right now, um, and I think I'm most proud of it because we just passed our certification uh, for essentially being a diesel fuel equivalent is the DOE funded project that we have uh, from the Bioenergy Technologies Office that uh, we've developed. Uh, we've worked very hard with our project partners at RTI to develop an authentic biofuel um, blend uh, for essentially compression ignition engines. And the goal here is once again, for those hard to decarbonize sectors, essentially replace up to the up to 50% of the number two diesel fuel including maybe what you may burn at your house and essentially be able to have not just comparable performance, comparable performance at better colder weather performance for a biofuel with less sooting propensity. If we're gonna be sitting here essentially playing chemist uh, in developing our new fuel or our fuel replacement, we aren't just trying to get the same energy density out of the fuel. We might as well engineer it to have better performance. But of course that creates unique challenges. So the technical approach is to work with, uh, with RTI here uh, and essentially they have a catalytic fast pyrolysis unit um, and they hydro process liquid fuels and they can operate this reactor which is a one ton per day reactor. It's, it's a very baby reactor. It's a huge room. 
but very baby for the amount of oil or fuel that we would need to essentially uh, really produce to displace 50% of the diesel fuel consumption. But this is a prototype project, a scaled project, uh, you know, let's call it a proof of concept to say, you know, can we successfully do this, right? From the test tube all the way to burning it in an engine and actually measuring it in an emission analyzer that you see on the right. And well, first we had to start to understand the fuel chemistry effects on the thermophysical properties. So these reactors, they can make a multitude of essentially uh, bio oils or bio blend stock oil bases, uh, but we don't always know what component is beneficial. So for example, when we're trying to target cloud point, we looked at varying the concentration of naphthenic hydrocarbons. We looked at varying the concentration of polyaromatic hydrocarbons, and we looked at varying the concentration of phenolics. And depending on this chemical group, essentially the concentration that was present, we tested and we saw, do we get better cold weather performance, which is what we see on the left versus, and how do we, how does that also replicate for the uh, suiting performance, essentially how much of that black smoke that you potentially would be developing if you burned it. And we essentially saw and we found that we absolutely need to increase the naphthenic content to be the maximum possible. And in fact, we need to reduce the aromatic content that's in these fuels. So with this, we finally had marching orders and um, Ofe, Monte, and David Dayton over at RTI went uh, went to work to essentially develop us this bio blend stock surrogate fuel uh, or the bio blend stock oil. After three uh, successful um, iterations on the surrogate fuel blend and a couple trial runs uh, at the facility, we were essentially able to pass uh, the ASTM certification for D975. This is the spec that all diesel fuel passes in the US in order to call it diesel fuel. Otherwise, it's just an oil. Uh, this means that we can actually cut it into real diesel fuel and put it at the pump. Uh, of course, we didn't quite make it as cleanly as we wanted because it's, it's, a, it's a very hard problem to crack here. Uh, but honestly, uh, we didn't really fall short in any ways that even regular fossil fuels fall short sometimes. Right? So when you buy fuel, the fuel itself is crude that's been refined. And a lot of times there's additives that are added to that fuel itself. And um, these additives uh, essentially can help certain characteristics of the fuel. And one of these, for example, is a property that doesn't even affect combustion, but has to do with the handling. And we had near zero conductivity uh, in our fuel, which essentially can, can cause some issues. Right? Um, and essentially, we can solve the cetane number being just a little bit lower once we blend it. Uh, and the conductivity with, with additives like the rest of the world. So we get a green check mark from DOE on that front. Uh, we also further showed that we were able uh, to reduce in this blended capacity of a 10% blend, 30% blend, a 50% blend substitute of diesel fuel. Uh, we were able to essentially improve the cold weather performance by 85%, uh, which is fantastic for a biofuel. And in fact, we were able to increase the smoke point, which reduces the sooting propensity by 10%. I mean, these are fantastic goals that we had to work really, really hard towards. And ultimately, we ran this in the engine. Um, and our first of two citations uh, of, of references out uh, in fuel, and the next one uh, by Rand et al., next one by Risto Hadlich et al., uh, will be uh, presented at SAE later this year. But we really did see not only kind of better thermal physical properties, but when we ran them in the engine, we were able to increase the fuel conversion to have 3% higher while we decreased emissions, 20% on total hydrocarbons, 10% on unburned carbon monoxide, or I mean, uh, on carbon monoxide, and NOx essentially didn't even register. We don't even need after treatment at this point. So the impact of this work actually can be huge. Instead of having dirty trucks running, I don't know, West Texas oil or something, we can have nice green electrified uh, hybridized Volvos uh, running these biofuels uh, that essentially are less dependent on fossil diesel. So there's clearly a, a good pathway here. And as part of this project, there's a full life cycle analysis. And you can see that the greenhouse gas emissions are actually um, reduced by 50% for 
the naphthenic biofuel that's being produced compared to diesel fuel. So really there's quite a huge impact, you know, if we can get this right. Now, my love for fuels didn't, didn't start at Stony Brook. I've just only spent a couple of years trying, uh, with my team trying to get this fuel right. Um, it actually started in grad school uh, as I essentially was a member of an optical combustion laboratory. And, you know, they say a picture is worth a thousand words. I wonder what, you know, a 10,000 frame video uh, may be worth in terms of word count. Uh, but this is really where I got my love for combustion and for burning different fuels and really kind of visualizing what's going on in the combustion chamber. And you can see here, um, this is a essentially a single stroke engine where we compress a very large volume into a smaller volume that's encapsulated right here in, in the end. Uh, and it's a cylindrical volume, it's a constant volume. Uh, and you have a mixture that's at a very high temperature and pressure that represents the conditions at end of compression for a piston engine. And we can essentially not only record the pressure trace, but also record um, uh, essentially the, the cinematography associated with it. And we can ignite gasoline surrogate fuels such as isooctane air and really start to push the boundary of at what point can we support a laminar flame. If we can't support a laminar flame, there's certainly no way in a reciprocating piston engine where we have a very turbulent environment that we can actually support a flame. So my early grad work looked at understanding the lean flammability limit for essentially uh, iso-octane air mixtures. And I span space in fuel energy. Um, it's a function of the mixture as well as the mixture dilution. So you can uh, essentially, as we pull back the fuel content or the air fuel, as we increase the air to fuel ratio, you're decreasing in this equivalence ratio space. And as you are moving to the right mixture dilution, that's the equivalent of adding additional air or specifically recirculated exhaust products, which is a common way in order to control peak combustion temperatures. The name of the game here is to run very lean, have little fuel energy in, in the content in order to take the thermodynamic advantages of, of a lean system. And to essentially run as low temperature as highly diluted as possible, such that you don't form any nitrogen oxides. Of course, a limit was developed or found, you know, from uh, essentially sparking these mixtures at these high temperatures and pressures. And we found that the limit existed far below where you would actually be able to support with spark ignition um, a flame in a conventional engine. Granted, these are laminar flames, right? So that's why we could go lower. But in a real engine, a spark ignition source can't really ignite anything much below 0 0.8, 0 0.7, maybe 0 0.6 in some very extreme circumstances, but nowhere near this limit of around 0.35 that we could unlock. So the solution, get rid of the spark plug. And I worked with Hyundai for uh, basically the second half of my uh, graduate uh, career in order to develop a better ignition energy or better activation energy to overcome uh, the barrier of just the energy that could be introduced into the chamber from a spark source. To do this, we essentially developed this, what you see here, this is a, a pre-chamber. It's, here's your main chamber that you see in the engine, the pistons on the bottom, the cylinder heads on top. And in this pre-chamber, we would prepare an air fuel mixture that was more ignitable than the main chamber, kickstart the combustion process inside this pre-chamber, and essentially have unburnt radicals, hot thermal mass, and essentially highly enthalpious flows, leaving this pre-chamber to essentially kickstart the combustion in the main chamber. Now, these were passively fueled pre-chambers, so that means that we had to get the air and the fuel inside this pre-chamber. So we spent a lot of time developing the actual flow field that you see here. And this flow field essentially is essentially coined as a split reverse tumble. And if we could inject to the left and to the right within that flow field, which has been optimized by actually affecting you know, the port, 
the piston shape, um, the valve events, all the geometry really needed to be optimized in order to get this. Um, and then essentially we could inject in to these sides and we could have the fuel break up and essentially vaporize, mix and get pushed right into these pre-chambers. And we even figured out that there was an optimal window during the compression stroke when you could do this in order to bias enough control, right? Because an engine usually doesn't run at just one fixed speed load condition. And well, I guess, you know, I convinced enough Hyundai dollars to, to come this way that, you know, through uh, essentially Reynolds average Navier Stokes simulations here of cold flow uh, air and fuel mixing um, that we actually built this entire facility. We made a single cylinder prototype engine that was actually optical. You see the metal liner that's installed right here. We got a patent, we published this, and you can see here the prototype pre-chambers, their volumes that are connecting orifices and the custom cylinder head that was designed um, and including the upper and the lower that you see there. Uh, and we basically retrofitted production products to get this G whiz um, concept off the ground. We went through six geometric iterations. This represents probably the effort of uh, close to three quarters of a million dollars to get there. It's about $1 million for one real metal engine prototype. They just use cheap graduate labor so they can do it uh, even, even cheaper than the normal. But you know, none of this would have been enabled after we went through six geometry iterations. That would have been $6 million that we needed to get this concept off the ground. So the computation really enabled us to essentially unlock a new hardware device that had a higher activation energy source than a spark ignition source that could burn leaner mixtures and achieve these low temperature combustion regimes that we wanted to unlock. One would say that I was done with pre-chambers after graduate school, but it turned out that our first grant here at Stony Brook, our first industry grant, I get a call and there's a company just across the sound that wanted to uh, liquid piss in to look once more at pre-chambers. And in this case, they didn't want to put them in a spark ignition uh, equivalent engine or gasoline engine. They wanted to do this in a miniature novel architecture, a rotary engine, and look at how can they essentially accelerate the compression ignition combustion. And of course, we had a lot of the same challenges. We had to design the combustion chamber geometry, the pre-chamber geometry, the flow field within the chamber, and especially time our injection or, or develop our injection strategy, which involved both kind of the number of plumes that are necessary, the angle for the sprays to, to penetrate into the chamber, the timing of these injections. But ultimately we were able to achieve a 98% combustion efficiency for this small novel rotary engine. Then really kind of the pathway to extending the future of internal combustion engines isn't just in fuels, right? That's just where we start. We start by finding a replacement for fossil fuels. You start first with biofuels and you eventually transition to carbon-free fuels. But the engine itself, remember when I called it a thermodynamic conversion device, an energy conversion device? Really, that itself can be improved on how we extract the, the high pressure and convert that into rotational motion. So traditionally reciprocating piston engines use that linear motion, they use a crank slider mechanism and they effectively use that linear motion to create the rotary motion. A rotary engine actually starts with that rotary motion, you're pushing sideways. There's also a number of other advantages because the chamber itself, you can have three analogous chambers that are essentially going through all the different phases of combustion. So first you try to improve your fuels, then you try to unlock new architectures based on computation, right? Otherwise it would be too expensive and too long to cut these metal. And then you transition to these kind of carbon free fuels. So our latest work funded by Office of Naval Research, a nice collaboration with UMass Lowell, um, is essentially to look at zero carbon and traditional logistics fuel combustion. I love zero carbon combustion. 
people always scratch their heads on how is this possible. And the reality is, is that hydrogen is very flammable and there's no carbon present. So we never form any CO2. Problem solved. Of course, you have nitrogen that's coming in as an oxidizer that you have to worry about. But ultimately, if you keep the temperatures low enough, then you should be fine because you don't actually develop any nitrogen oxides. Turns out that hydrogen is kind of a bear and yeah, it's very reactive and we have quite a bit of experience with it in the laboratory, um, but we have almost near zero experience with ammonia until now. And ammonia is an excellent hydrogen carrier. In fact, you can split ammonia in order to generate hydrogen on the fly. And ammonia has the wonderful property that it hates to be burned or combusted. So you can actually use ammonia as a way to temper the hydrogen combustion. So ammonia is a great hydrogen carrier. Ammonia can essentially isolate the combustion or dampen the reactivity of hydrogen. Sounds like a win-win solution to me. And of course, there's kind of this notion of green hydrogen that I really hope we get to one day. But green hydrogen requires renewable energy. Fine. Let's just assume that gets done in the next 10, 15 years. There's another challenge with green hydrogen that no one likes to talk about, or maybe no one really has thought about it yet. And that problem with green hydrogen has to do with how clean the water is that you start with in order to produce the hydrogen. If the hydrogen, if the water has impurities, because it's not perfectly distilled, you essentially attack the membrane that will be performing the electrolysis. And um, you, I'm, I'm sorry, when you split the water and you have electrolysis, you have the hydrogen, you also carry some impurities. And when that fuel, the hydrogen plus the impurities get to be electrochemically converted in a fuel cell, you actually attack the membrane. So what good is hydrogen, green hydrogen, if it's not very pure hydrogen? And we have this target at $1 uh, per kilogram of hydrogen uh, set from DOE. And presently speaking, we're probably about an order of magnitude off that, 10 on the production. But it's forecasted that we need 2 to $3 per kilogram to essentially have a water treatment plant up front of the hydrogen of the water in order to have clean water to split and not have impurities for hydrogen. So this is a fantastic opportunity because engines shouldn't play to replace electric vehicles or electric motors. And engines should not play to replace fuel cells, right? Each device has its own niche where it makes a whole lot of sense. And we need all three devices. But this is one of those areas where if you have impure green hydrogen, green hydrogen from gray water, as I like to call it, those impurities are essentially negligible when you go to thermochemically convert the hydrogen instead of electrochemically converting. So that's an area where internal combustion engines can have carbon-free combustion. They have advantages over fuel cells in the future. And that's essentially what we're looking for. Of course, we're basically crawling right now because we haven't burned ammonia or hydrogen in the engine. And you don't just work up to, 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 to burning it, you know, putting it in there, right? Because that's not kind of the most efficient or the smartest way to go about it. Because we also care not just to get it to burn, right? I'm sure that there's enough engineers out there that know how to do that. But we care to understand the fundamentals that drive good ammonia and good hydrogen combustion. So with this project, we're essentially going to be starting at first picking a chemical kinetic mechanism that can deal with ammonia and hydrogen combustion, ammonia and hydrogen blend combustion. And from there, we'll essentially be doing 1D, I'm sorry, uh, not 1D, but quiescent environment uh, experiments where we will be computationally looking at how the kinetic mechanism works up against a constant volume chamber. And once we've gotten confidence inside this quiescent environment in this chamber, both computationally and experimentally, then we can take the kinetic mechanism and apply it to a 3D reciprocating piston engine and perhaps even resolve the turbulence more than just using RANDs, but perhaps with large eddy simulations and really guide the combustion before we ever even put it in the single cylinder in the laboratory. And that's exactly where we're at. We're presently looking at 
picking a good ammonia mechanism to essentially replicate the 1D experiments that are being performed at UMass Lowell. And we can computationally see, once we can replicate these same experiments, then we know we have a good high fidelity kinetic mechanism that works in a quiescent environment. So then we can essentially crank up the turbulence. And then from there, we can essentially more accurately predict the engine. The engine itself is very complicated if you try to model it instantly, right? There's just, it's very, very high Reynolds number flows and you have a whole lot of chemistry. It's very hard to uh, properly describe. Of course, you get a nice break with ammonia and hydrogen because essentially the reaction mechanisms are quite small and the number of species involved in decomposition as well as the number of reactions uh, are manageable. But if you're looking at a fuel like gasoline or biodiesel, I mean, you're talking about maybe for, for, for gasoline, 3,000 species and 10,000 reactions that you would need to model just to get the combustion chemistry accurate, not even to resolve the flow field, right? So it becomes a bear of a problem. But we've gotten pretty good at reducing these kinetic mechanisms, or not us specifically, but our peers and our collaborators. And not only do they reduce them, but eventually if we want to go to these high fidelity uh, mechanisms where we want to very accurately resolve the flow inside the combustion chamber, then we essentially have to go to these skeletal reaction mechanisms. And when you do that, there's a whole lot of fun work that, that you can unlock. So once you start talking about high fidelity modeling um, in uh, essentially mm, these computational engines, um, you're afforded a new set of diagnostic tools. I'm really an experimentalist at heart that uses computation in order to see in the combustion chamber, maybe akin to my early learnings of how I used optical imaging. If you think about it, if you can accurately model something, right? As an experimentalist, we know what reality is. We put the air in, we put the fuel, we measure that, we measure what comes out on the tailpipe. And if the conditions work, we can put a check mark and we can call ourselves good industry engineers. But understanding really the fundamentals of why certain conditions work better than others is what makes us researchers and ultimately scientists. Because we don't care to just get one variant to work. That's Ford's job, that's GM's job. Our job is to essentially extend the body of knowledge of why these advanced combustion modes or these advanced fuels or these carbon-free fuels work and when they work best. So then industry can take our work and then apply it in order to actually mechanize the research and get it into everyone's hands. So in this case, we're looking at a uh, advanced combustion mode called partial fuel stratification. This is a medium duty or heavy duty combustion. So applicable to those large trucks, uh, perhaps even ships, um, maybe not airplanes, but um, you know, anything that's got a medium duty or heavy duty engine today. And especially if we didn't wanna use a diesel fuel or diesel like heavy fuel, we could use gasoline. And in fact, if you use gasoline under high pressures, you can essentially create a stratified condition inside the chamber, and you can have a cascading series of auto ignitions. But in order to do that, you best be able to model very well how the fuel in the air mixes, and you best be able to model very well how the chemistry itself works. And if you can do that, you can essentially start looking at these unique Diagram. So this is work by uh, graduate student Guleri et al. with Sandia National Lab. It's fantastic. And essentially, you're looking at a few million cells. You're looking at the, the inside of an internal combustion engine, and you are spatially visualizing for each cell the fuel energy on the y-axis versus the temperature that each cell finds itself in. And we know that few cells that have essentially more fuel energy are going to ignite faster. But we also know that there's a temperature effect. So the hotter you are, you can have less fuel energy, but you might be able to ignite faster than maybe more fuel energy in a cell that's sitting at a lower temperature. So there's this balance. And looking at it, you know, depending on, you know, this, you know, we're essentially doing two, a double injection event here in order to create a stratified condition. You can see that there is a difference in behavior 
of when you have certain cells ignite. You can see them when they ignite, essentially the temperature of the cell will go from being an unburned around 900 or 1000 Kelvin all the way up to close to 2000 Kelvin. But you can physically see the jump here and you can start to track what cells are actually contributing to this combustion. And that to us is so valuable because in the engine, I can measure bulk performance. I can measure the peak pressure, but I can't actually physically locate within the chamber where my combustion is starting or what the temperature and pressure conditions or what the fuel energy associated with those cells that's actually starting to auto to, 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 to start the, 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 the series of cascade ignition. But using CFD, we are able to essentially unlock this and visualize inside the chamber where the combustion is starting. We can use that to our advantage. We can essentially communicate where and when this type of advanced combustion strategy can unlock higher thermal efficiencies, higher fuel conversion efficiencies. And we can even use this as a diagnostic tool because sometimes you might have conditions where it works 90% of the time. In fact, most auto industry folks that work on engine research, they don't research how to build an engine. They know how to do that very well. They usually spend their time on 90% of the time, on 10% on of the conditions or 5% of the conditions that are non attaining for emissions or have bad performance. And they really don't understand what's going on inside that chamber. So if we could provide that guidance, especially you know, as advanced combustion modes become more and more challenging, right, to, to, to get right 100% because of the increased complexity, you can use CFD in order to provide that guidance. And here's a case where as you increase the stratification, as we increase, so as we inject later and later in the compression stroke near top dead center, uh, you essentially should start to see uh, the combustion uh, advance happen closer uh, to the edge. And there's like a period here where we have three points that, for example, had this trade-off behavior. We saw a plateau. It was very, very unusual. You expected the line to be linearly decreasing. And it wasn't until Gaurav essentially modeled these under very, very high fidelity mo uh, computational models to, to really start to understand what is going on. So remember that fuel energy trade-off that uh, I discussed? Let me go in the interest of time. That fuel energy that I was discussing is a trade-off between temperature and um, and, and fuel energy for essentially when the ignition will, will start or kick off. And what we started to see is we saw this kind of unusual behavior where you had higher fuel energy cells essentially existing at colder temperatures because of the way the fuel in the air was mixed and having self-similar performance as to areas where you had lower fuel energy and having higher temperatures. And where do these lower temperatures come from? And it turns out that the areas of fuel plus air, where the areas of richer cells, where you had more fuel plus, plus air, uh, you had more fuel for a fraction of air, were located near the walls. So you were essentially affected by the heat transfer to the walls, the colder coolant. So, I mean, this is like fantastic when you get to wrap all this together. And it's really kind of improved our guidance of how we can use this advanced combustion mode of partial fuel stratification to essentially use gasoline and medium duty, heavy duty engines and, and achieve higher thermal efficiency. We've taken that collaboration a step further. Uh, we're now actually working with Ford and Converge and Cindia National Lab, as well as Mississippi State and uh, CMT Motores uh, uh, in Spain to essentially optimize for both performance and to minimize emissions. Uh, we're gonna be optimizing the combustion chamber and the fuel uh, spray and the air mixing um, in an off-road diesel engine. So we're very excited about this work. And lastly, every now and then, uh, sometimes we get involved in some other activities. Uh, I was called off the bench to help uh, essentially build the ventilator with uh, John Longton and John Bertelli. Uh, just maybe a few weeks after I got here in January of 2020, uh, the pandemic hit. Uh, so we built the Corvent 2020 uh, in about 10 days. Uh, and
and essentially we applied our knowledge of flow uh, and as mechanical engineers uh, put it put our hats to work. Uh, and uh, you know another project that we've done with uh, uh, Mahmoud Kuraim, uh, who's uh, in in our research group, is essentially doing a techno-economic analysis of a shrouded wooden turbine where we looked at two different. Um, actually multiple and optimized kind of a simpler geometry airfoil that was cheaper to manufacture, uh, as well as kind of this optimized uh, diffuser geometry. And uh, essentially looked at what the techno-economic analysis was, of course, adding a complicated diffuser improves performance, uh, but perhaps it doesn't actually always improve performance for where you need it. Uh, and we end up finding that the levelized cost of electricity uh, is not always cheaper by improving performance, uh, as well as uh, from a life cycle perspective, uh, you're not always better off with adding complexity to the design. So a few of our recent publications, and thank you very much for your attention. Happy to take any questions. All right, thank you very much for a nice talk. Um, there was a question earlier in the chat from Christian Santoni. Do you want to run with that, Christian? Oh, sorry, I didn't even see the chat. Uh, I see there's a few questions. That was combustion efficiency. I think that was for the pre-chamber prototype engine. Ah, um, yeah, maybe. Which prototype is it? The second one, maybe. That that's my guess, but I don't know. Is is Christian still on and could ask her? Did we bore them to death? <laughs> no, no, no. I'm here. Uh, I just want to know how you measured the combustion efficiency. Okay. Um, so I, on specifically this uh, this engine, the um, the liquid piston one. Yeah. Okay, uh, so essentially when the fuel is injected, we allow for it to combust with a kinetic mechanism, uh, and then we can track the unburned fuel, uh, and essentially the difference between the burned and the unburned can tell us what our combustion efficiency is. Okay, thank you. So we're at the end, if people need to trickle out, but maybe a couple of more questions, would that be okay, Demetrius? Sure, yeah, I'm happy to take as much time as... Let's see, let's see if I can view. I don't see, I'll ask you a quick question while we're on the pre-chambers. Uh, you showed a, a video of the actual engine running in the lab. Was that a, a supercharger that was built, uh, belt driven on the top or is it a normally aspirated engine? Yeah. All right. Good eye. Um, so that is, um, okay. So this engine actually imagine where does your cylinder head gasket normally sit? It sits right above the block and below the cylinder head. This is what we call a Bowditch piston engine or an extended, uh, engine, extended piston engine. Essentially there's a block that sits down here and you have your crankshaft, and your connecting rod to your piston. And on that piston is actually open on top. There's no cylinder head there. Ah. And you bolt literally a cylinder, an extended, an extension or stanchion onto that piston. And then you actually recreate the combustion chamber, not down here, but at a, at a relative location higher up. And you essentially create, and if you can see here, this is the outside liner. And that extension tube runs all the way through that liner and you essentially put your new piston up here. This allows you to have optical access here so you can take a cutout in this extension tube, put a 45 degree mirror. And now if I have a transparent piston, if I put a quartz window in there, I can shoot a camera at the 45 degree mirror and look straight up into my combustion chamber. So we essentially, re we, we, we remove the cylinder head from being directly onto the block and we recreate that entire combustion chamber higher up where now we can see the combustion in, up there. So the, the belt drives the 
the, the valves at the t very top then or? Yeah, so these are okay. two camshafts here and essentially, yeah, so this is the front accessory drive block that you see the black uh, uh, piece of, uh, I think it was steel. Um, and our crankshaft's at the bottom and somehow we have to synchronize the crankshaft to the camshafts. So the gear ratios are carefully picked between the primary and the secondary belt to essentially recreate this two to one ratio that's necessary. Um, so that way the valves only open once for every two motions of the piston. Gotcha. That's neat. Thank you. Absolutely. Any other questions? I sure do. I see that uh, the slides were cut off. I, I hope they were. Uh, it sounds like they were fixed. I think that was fixed. Yeah. Okay. Fantastic. Thanks. So. I know people have to go, but I, I've got a whole barrage. Um, I'll just ask one more, and this is kind of a general question, but I have heard the argument made that it's hopelessly inefficient, but is a serial hybrid like a diesel electric train ever going to be an option? A serial hybrid train? Well, a, you, a diesel, say a diesel engine that drives an electric generator, and then you use the electricity to drive the vehicle. I've heard that that just will never work for an, an automobile. And, and I was wondering if you had any thoughts on that. Um, so here's a real challenge. An engine, when you look at it, you know, we can improve the third, we can essentially, for every fuel energy that you put in, about one third of it, you'll be able to extract work out from the engine. One third will be reduced, will be rejected to heat. Right. And one third will be flown out the exhaust, essentially a lost enthalpy flow. If you can recover some of that lost exhaust, you can essentially do some energy recovery. That's what a really a turbocharger does. Right. Um, there are other ways you potentially could recover it, but that would help drive the thermal efficiency and improve it. Or alternatively, you have to make use of that wasted heat somehow. So when you talk about a serial hybrid, you know, it's not necessarily a bad plan. You just have to maybe factor a few more items. And I don't know that maybe transportation is the right application for that, but okay. perhaps a stationary application might be. So we have these combined heat and power plants where you take that wasted heat that's rejected from the engine block and you basically heat domestic hot water. So all of a sudden it's not a 30% loss. It's just a diverted 30% amount of energy. Then you slap on a turbocharger, uh, maybe even a thermoelectric device uh, to essentially help uh, reduce the lost enthalpy uh, from the exhaust. And then you actually drive a generator from the crankshaft and you make electricity to offset the building. So now you have hot water that you could do hydronic heating with or domestic hot water. You're essentially taking the work out from the engine at the crankshaft and really displacing some of the local uh, electricity uh, that's coming from the grid. Uh, you're displacing from local, uh, locally produced electricity. Uh, and then you essentially try to minimize what goes off the exhaust. So, Th that arrangement is not far off from, I think, what you're describing it. I think maybe more for stationary applications of maybe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Something you, you, you wouldn't want hot water in your car. Yeah, that, that makes sense. Thanks. <laughs> maybe to make some tea, but like that's about it, right? Yeah. Okay, so there's one more in the chat, and then I think we should declare a victory if we've got a moment more. Uh, sure. So, how much would be uh, the amount of torque generated after burning biofuels versus heavy fuels like diesel? given they are used to drive heavy vehicles like trucks. Yeah, so everything goes back down to essentially the lower heating value of the fuel. And biofuels can have potentially, uh, maybe some of the synthetic biofuels could have a lower heating value, um, but a lot of the biofuels maybe actually have more heating value. So there's nothing that says that a biofuel itself has less fuel energy than the petroleum fossil that it's trying to fossil fuel that it's trying to replace. 
some of the challenges are we, we, we struggle with vaporizing uh, and mixing the biofuel with the air, which maybe will lead to lower combustion performance. So that's kind of the equivalent of having less energy. Uh, but as far as I'm concerned, th th there's nothing fundamentally wrong with biofuels that would mm, essentially tell you that it's, it's a lesser alternative, uh, especially in, in pork extraction. Yeah. All right. Well, that was absolutely fascinating in, in my not so humble opinion. And uh, quite a few people have stayed on for a few extra minutes. So I, I think we should declare a victory and thank you for a very nice talk. All right. Thank you so much for having me. Really appreciate it.